all live in this world and we are all uh, a strand of life in the, in the whole web of life. And whatever do we, we do to one strand, we affect the other strands within that, within that web of life. And certainly when we look at what we do with the water today and, and how we treat it or how we don't treat it, there's two differences there. There's water treatment, but there's also a non-treatment. And if we just sit by idly and, and do nothing, then what are we telling our grandchildren? What kind of message are we sending? A lot of people are really struggling to get enough clean water day to day. We have an incredible gift here. We have the most precious natural resource that a country could have, that a province could have. Watershed is a million square kilometers, four states, four provinces. I predicted that what is happening to Lake Winnipeg would soon be recognized as a national environmental catastrophe. And I was wrong. It's actually worse than that. 20 years ago, it wasn't obvious that we had major sustainable development issues in our own backyard. You have to have all those 6.6 .6 million people behind us to turn this around. We've got to work together is basically what, it, what it's all about. We have a rather unique situation where the Red River flows north. Most rivers in North America flow south, but we have a river that flows north. We have the uh, Saskatchewan River and the Assiniboine River, which joins the Red River that flows from west to east. So when we talk about cleaning up Lake Winnipeg, we have to make sure we're talking about the dishwashers in Calgary. We're talking about low flush toilets in Fargo. We're talking about what folks do at the lake in Lake of the Woods because it all flows into that body that we love and cherish so much in Manitoba, Lake Winnipeg. A number of reasons why we need Lake Winnipeg healthy. First of all, it's the major recharge zone for the aquifer that, that uh, covers eastern Manitoba, the inner lake, and even into the West Man area. So we need to keep the entire basin happy, healthy, which includes Lake Winnipeg, Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin, uh, and, and uh, the Red and, and Cinnaboyne Rivers. The second issue that we need to keep in mind is that it is a large economic driver for the province of Manitoba. We have over 1,200 commercial fishers just on Lake Winnipeg alone and uh, over two-thirds of those are Aboriginal fishers and this is how they make their livelihood. And then the third part is that Lake Winnipeg is also a huge tourism attraction with all the great beaches that we see in the East Beach areas, uh, even up uh, along Lake w um, Winnipeg Beach and Gimli. Those are fantastic beaches and people want to be able to go out there, enjoy themselves, support those local communities, go out and do some sport fishing, water skiing, uh, and just pleasure boating. And so those are important uh, issues for people that enjoy it and make use of the lake. I know my family, we love to go out to the beach and we want to make sure that uh, our families are, are healthy when they are entering the, the water. There are a couple problems. One is related to water quality, one is related to too much water from uh, excess runoff from the land and the watershed basin. So what happens in the Red River Basin is as water accumulates in the spring and during summer rains and, and, and wet cycles like we're in now, it moves north into Lake Winnipeg and as it does it picks up uh, soil as it moves across the land either in rural or urban settings and a lot of times as it does that it'll pick up nutrients like phosphorus, carry that along with the soil particles, they'll settle in the bottom of the lake in the sediment in the water column and then they're there for algae and that's part of what's causing the algae blooms. The real effect that, uh, that this excess algae has on the lake happens when the algae die and they sink to the bottom and they rot on the bottom of the lake. And this process uses up oxygen in the water, oxygen that's necessary for the creatures that live in the water. And that's how it can choke the lake in a sense from the bottom up. 
So the solution to the problem, of course, is that we have to stop uh, our input of nutrients in the best way we possibly can by using products that are lower or, or don't have any of these nutrients in them, by treating our sewage, uh, by best agricultural practices and other things. And we have to continue to monitor the lake to see if in fact this is having the desired effect. Whether we use phosphorus uh, detergents, uh, how much fertilizer we apply on our lawns, uh, our, our parks and golf courses and other recreational uh, outdoor facilities uh, use a lot of different uh, fertilizers. And of course there, there is uh, the agricultural, industrial and municipal activities that happen. So we have to do a better job in water treatment and wastewater management. Uh, we have to do a better job in, in, in uh, looking at how we regulate and manage uh, farm practices. There's a great concern about not only what we're doing today to provide economic viability for, for our household, but also we want to have a sustainable goal. The Conservation District is also working with agricultural producers, specifically those of uh, grain farmers. And if their land uh, goes straight up to a ditch or a waterway, usually they have erosion problems, we'll, we'll assist them in creating buffer strips. So these are areas directly against the agricultural um, productive land, but leave in a good five, eight meters of a vegetative buffer strip where no applications will be uh, applied to that area. It reduces the sediment going into the creek and there's also potential of removing nutrients as well. Everyone can help. It isn't confined to any one group of people. City dwellers, country folk, they're all potentially involved. Uh, and for example, uh, people who live in cities should be concerned about buffer strips adjacent to waterways. If they live on a waterway, if they live along a river, or if they have a cottage, for example, along the lakeshore, they should be concerned about protecting the vegetation along those waterways. Natural vegetation is the single best thing to have along waterways. You're not expected to retain every drop that falls on your farm. It's impossible, it's not financially responsible even. But there are certain situations that possibly we can consolidate water. We can set aside a, per a percentage of our farm. I don't know if it's one, two, three percent, four percent. But if we could hold that little bit of water back and, and, and recharge that water table, what we're doing is ensuring that our, those who follow us will have water. And um, I just know in my heart that we are not supposed to drain every ounce of water off our property. Well, the key thing to remember is that nutrients have a big economic value to producers and we want to make sure we use them as efficiently as possible at all times. So it is really in our own best interest to uh, continue on the course we're on, to be uh, good stewards of the environment and to value the nutrients that are available to us. If we drain every corner of our country and push it into the ditch and into the river and finally into Lake Winnipeg, and turn around someday and say, my tap's not working, I have no water. There's a cost to pay. And so we might as well start paying now to protect that and preserve it for the kids that come, for the generations that come after us. I think our industry is uh, well positioned to uh, take responsibility for uh, the areas where we can improve, but we want to share that responsibility with uh, all, all contributors. And we need to have our regulators look at the entire situation and not just agriculture. This is a wake-up call for all of us to pay more attention to the environment that we live in. Uh, this problem didn't happen overnight. It's probably taken with the information we have uh, the last 50 years to develop to the extent that it has right now. So, so the take-home message there is uh, certainly we're all busy in our day-to-day -day activities, but we have to stop on a regular basis and say what are our activities doing to the environment that we live in. Think about this, that what we put down our sinks and toilets eventually does end up in the ocean and we're in the prairies, that's phenomenal. As local government, giving consideration on how large the watershed is, we need to all come together on this page. Ultimately, uh, citizens have to be engaged, but the vehicle by which they have things done, of course, are governments. Uh, at the grassroots level, we have the municipal governments that are fundamentally important to ensure that a lot of this stuff gets done. Municipal officials should in turn find out what can be done, what solutions there are in their communities, and then, of course, undertake them. I think local governments are, are putting a lot of effort into putting in uh, drainage ditches, swales, and trying to protect uh, and manage their properties from flood levels. But what they're finding out is there's economic solutions with even how you manage your ditches, how you design them. Again, uh, low maintenance grasses, buffer strips along farmlands. And I think the, uh, you're finding now that there's less 
weed infiltration, the farmers are protected from, from weeds because native grasses are hardier, and the water quality throughout their district is better. One of the most uh, interesting developments in the last decade has been developers stumbling across sustainable practices as something that is cost effective. And uh, we were involved in a project where LADCO spent years investing in the notion of converting standard stormwater retention basins to wetlands. And they found the quality of the water was so attractive, the property values went up for anybody that backed on these. They were paying the same amount for wetland lots as for river lots. And so it had a compelling argument to the developer that it wasn't costing them any more to do what was right for the lake. Our municipalities and cities uh, have recognized for decades the importance of uh, managing uh, water uh, discharge from, from their uh, systems. They've recognized recently that uh, it's, it's also important to deal with the nutrient load that's coming in the wastewaters, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus uh, uh, are things that uh, are constituents that uh, municipalities are recognizing are, are a part of the contribution to the overall uh, deterioration of, of surface water uh, globally and um, they've recognized uh, uh, in recent years that it's important uh, that as, as stewards of, of uh, the environment that they uh, take care of the, uh, the nutrients that they're contributing to this, uh, to this issue. The Donater uh, Passive Filter project uh, is unique in that uh, it, it utilizes a, a flow regime that's uh, somewhat different than a wetland. Uh, this uh, particular facility has been uh, developed uh, whereby there is um, uh, a flow uh, through the, the media uh, and there's a vegetation layer that's been, been selected, the, the plants have been uh, specifically selected uh, so that uh, uh, when, they, when we grow this, uh, this vegetation uh, we can harvest it uh, two, three times a year. Uh, this vegetation uh, has phosphorus uptake through the root system uh, that extracts the uh, the phosphorus from the from the filter and from the wastewater, and that allows uh, allows us to um, harvest the plant material. We can compost it, and then that phosphorus is available for use in agriculture. Manitoba has a lot of wetlands compared to a lot of places in. Canada and essentially the one common element to all of our wetlands is that they have water, pretty obvious, uh, but also that the results of that water is that it produces conditions that are very unique and only certain kinds of life can live there. So you have certain characteristic plants, cattails, bulrushes, a few other things. So what the result I guess is that a wetland is one of the most diverse places on the landscape. We know, for example, that if we harvest the plants from wetlands, rather than just seeing them as just a liability to get rid of, uh, we can take those plants and use them for something. I mean, one thing we know, for instance, is that they are great sponges for nutrients. The plants take up large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus, two of the biggest culprits in deteriorating water quality. By harvesting the, the, the marsh grasses that grow there, we we capture the nutrients that would otherwise enter the lake and we create a biomass feedstock supply. And so when we take this, this biomass, these marsh grasses, and we convert them into bioenergy and displace, in some cases, fossil fuels because we can heat buildings with this stuff, for example, we create at least two likely three if not more revenue streams. We have the value of the biomass and the energy itself. We have the value of displacing fossil fuels so that generates a carbon offset. And we have the value of recovering the nutrients in the ash so we can reuse them in agricultural fertilizers. We have the opportunity to manage this, the, the, the Lake Winnipeg Basin in such a way that not only does it produce high quality water, reduce nutrient loads to the lake, but we can generate all kinds of economic development opportunities out in the basin. So I think the, the, the simplest message on that front is that we're missing an opportunity the way we're currently doing things. We have a challenging issue with respect to our water resources. So what better opportunity 
to take that challenge and convert it into an opportunity of building an economic base, economic innovation, clean technology, and then to sell that technology around the world. Because the truth is, water is the most precious resource that humans have, and yet it's being mismanaged everywhere. And so everyone's going to need this clean technology that could come right from Manitoba. So I view this whole situation as an opportunity for us to grow our economic base from a clean technology perspective. People can very easily be empowered once we give them the information. It's very important for us to explain to people that there's things we can do every day in our lives at home and at work that will make a very big difference. Business uh, frequently has the ability to provide resources and to provide direction and efficiencies to the current practices that we have in water management. Business uh, is well positioned to work effectively and engage and encourage our communities and manufacturing companies, all sorts of businesses to try to adapt their practices to protect our environment. All businesses want to do the right thing and it's a matter of education and awareness, recognizing that these these uh, cleaners exist, that they're effective, uh, that um, they're readily available and cost effective. That's the information that we need to get out to other businesses. Once that happens, it's a snowball effect. Everybody will start using this and we'll start to see a real uh, benefit to, to Lake Winnipeg as a result of everyone working at this problem together. If we engage students, and engage young people, they'll just naturally take it home and, and, and their parents will, will be dragged along whether they like it or not. Uh, and, and as you know, our whole Lake Friendly program, especially the, the logo and all that, started at, at the school level and it really engaged kids. It means a lot to me because it's something that I can support because I find the lake really important now because a lot of our everyday uses are with the lake, whether it's swimming to drinking water. And so we have to protect that because otherwise that's one large water source that we lose. I'm seeing a lot more people a lot more concerned about the lake and I think that's the, the biggest change. It's, it's very encouraging. It's going to take time to reduce that trend, but every year we're learning more and we're doing more. There was this understanding across a wide spectrum of stakeholders that it's not going to go away anytime soon. We are all in it together, but we can transform this into a very positive story and, a, and, and there, is a, there is an approach which brings everyone into a solution strategy. Whatever happens to me now, I've got nothing to lose. What I have is a little guy, two years old, still growing up, who's going to maybe be a fisherman someday. And I want him to be able to walk this spring or this summer into the water with his feet up to his knees and yelling and saying, we, instead of running his mother right, dragging him away because it's full of algae. Is that how we want to live? You could be romantic and, and an environmentalist and, and green to the gills and, and say everything looks so wonderful, but I guess in my heart, I, I know it's the right thing to do. Not one sector of society can do this alone. Government can't do it alone. Business can't do it alone. Civil society can't do it alone. But if individuals understand they're connected to the, to the, to the issue and the solution, then we'll have the, the momentum across society to build the will to do something for the long haul, because it's going to take a while. You know, it's just not enough to say, well, you know, somebody will handle it. I don't need to worry about that. No, everybody, each and every one of us has to be engaged. Lake Friendly is a way of being. It's a way of thinking about our actions on the earth, our actions and how they affect our water. Being Lake Friendly can be from purchasing products that are less environmentally harmful, products that are Ecologo certified. Being lake friendly can be protecting your wetlands, restoring natural shorelines. Being lake friendly can be about choosing not to use a product that you know may end up in the lake. Lake friendly is about engaging individuals. It's about giving people the confidence to know that what they do matters. As 6.5 million of us living in this great watershed, we all have to participate in this 
task before us if we're going to protect our lakes, rivers and streams and ensure we have fresh, clean water for our future. That spirituality is, is becoming awake now. A lot of our elders are not afraid to talk. And a lot of the leaders today that, that are leading are not afraid to talk. And I'm one of those leaders. I'm certainly going to exercise my, my, uh, my, my leadership and certainly going to exercise the knowledge that was transferred to me by the elders and as well spiritually and be able to openly talk about it as a person. I don't have to be talking as a First Nation person, but as a human being that has a love for his mother and has a love for our great-grandchildren, but moreover has a love and is responsible today on what we're going to leave tomorrow for our great-grandchildren. Thank you.